Hi, this is Brian Russell. Welcome back to class. I want to go over some of the questions that you asked. I didn't want to type really long answers, so I figured this would be easier to read. And so I would encourage you to go ahead and uh, move through the slides and you can read those. You can even advance the video that you'll be watching this on and then you can hear the answer to the question that you're interested in hearing or you can listen to the whole thing because I'll try to be concise and this is the sort of things I would do in a live class so I would recommend listening to everything but again it's you can go ahead and forward because I did I bullet pointed each of the questions let's go ahead and get started what is your best advice <clears throat> for getting started in IBS a couple things absolutely critical first pray and I mean that in all seriousness, because you want to open yourself up to all resources, including the Lord's guiding as you do this. And by praying, you're going to remember that you're actually working to encounter God through the text. Now, be patient with yourself. For many of you, this is going to be brand new, lots of new vocabulary. You're going to be asked to do things that you've never done before in studying the Bible. So be patient, but at the same time, be persistent. This is critical. Put the time in, in each week. I would suggest working in blocks. So please do not try to do an entire assignment in one sitting, unless you plan on sitting there all day. It's better to let the text kind of percolate around in your mind. So start one day, at least do it over two different sessions. And I wouldn't work on IBS for more than say two hour blocks because you need breaks to let your mind rest. So those would be some uh, best ways for getting started and make sure you stay current. If you fall behind, just move ahead to the next week and don't worry about what's behind you. You can make it up at some point, but stay current. That's critical. What's the best translation and format of the Bible to use for IBS? Uh, the best translation our translation is our modern translations. You'll see me use the ESV, the R NRSV, the NIV, uh, the New American Standard, uh, uh, any of the non-paraphrased translations. So Bibles that are less helpful would be um, the, the CEB or V. Um, you don't want to use the message. I wouldn't use the old King James just because it's not, wasn't rooted in the best manuscripts. And in terms of format, there, this was a question uh, from the Thompson book. The Thompson book is old, so it was, it was assuming the old King James format where essentially every verse was its own line and there were literally no paragraphs. He's recommending using a Bible with paragraphs. That's fine, and, and actually most Bibles that you'll purchase will have paragraphs in them. What you want to be careful, though, is not to be unduly influenced by the paragraph titles that many modern translations include, and perhaps you could um, use one without those. Because the paragraphs, as you may not know this, in the Greek manuscripts, Greek had no punctuation, and it had no paragraphs, and the chapters and verses are all well hundreds of years after the completion of the text. So uh, you want to um, not get locked into that because it's just how the editors did that. And if you would compare carefully different translations, the paragraphs will not always match up because that's an interpretation to even put that in there. Do I need to use commentaries or outside resources for a survey? No. A survey is not an interpretation. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next question. For the survey, all you're doing is observing. You uh, can follow the instructions very carefully. You don't need to check yourself on a commentary. The whole point is to essentially think of a survey as you're up in an airplane, you're looking down, and you're giving a map of the terrain, looking for the major features. If you're down in the weeds enough to have to use a commentary, you're probably not doing a survey. You're looking essentially just for the major breaks, like if you're going to make an outline of the passage, the big chunks, and then within those big chunks, um, how would you break up the, the, big, the big pieces? So again, you want to have a two deep outline or in main units, subunits, and structures, and then again, review the, the instructions carefully for what's required in a survey but you do not need to use any outside resources or commentaries. 
We only use um, secondary resources when we're actually doing interpretive work, which we won't be doing for several more weeks. It'll be well into March before you'll need to use a commentary. Do I need to do interpretive work when doing a survey? No. All you're doing is observing how the passage fits together. How do the big pieces within uh, the text fit? So for example, in you're working on the genealogy uh, right now, and then you'll be working on the second infancy passage in Matthew in another week. You don't have to, you don't need historical background to do the surveys. Did the authors assume things that their reader would know? Yes, but you work that out during interpretation. So you just take the text as is and attempt to organize it using the instructions that I've given you for survey. Again, watch the video how to do a survey again that briefly um, does it. I'm a bit curious about book as whole surveys differ with a massive book such as Genesis as Exodus. How many key passages and areas would you need to cite for either of these, for example? Believe it or not, the instructions for a segment are essentially the same ones that you use for a passage of any size or even a huge book like Genesis or Exodus. You're still going to have main units, subunits. And again, that the rule of thumb there is two to four main units with each of those main units having two to four subunits. That's going to stay the same. Obviously, they're going to be a lot bigger than they would be in a small segment. And the same with the key passages. The key passages aren't key because you think they're key. They're key passages because they're related to the structures that you find. Again, remember, in survey, you're looking for how do the main units connect with each other. What structures connect those? Or what structures, if you have a really big main unit that's over 50% of the whole, again, watch my video carefully when I'm explaining. This is the 50% rule. It's a main structure, a major structure, only if it connects two or more main units together. Or if it's a really massive main unit, if it controls 50% of the material. Otherwise, you're observing minor structure and you're getting into the weeds. So again, key passages, if you have four or five major structures, guess how many key passages you're going to have? Four or five. Every structure needs to have a key passage. Okay, so the size of the book doesn't matter. It's how many structures do you have. And for each structure, it's going to be represented within a key or strategic area. How do all the different interpretive integration set strategies really come to bear? When do you use one over another, and what does a good interpretive integration look like? We'll be getting to that in due course. It's always going to start with careful reading of the context, which we'll be explaining again in a couple of weeks. These first two weeks, we're just working on segment survey. Then we're going to add detailed observation and then begin to add some interpretation pieces. Essentially, it's always going to be context, and that would be the immediate context, like the paragraph level where your key area would be within a segment. Also, the evidence in the context from the segment, and then the evidence from the rest of the book. That's the bedrock of your interpretation. And then what you're going to ask yourself then is, what do I still need to know in order to understand this text because again you're going to be answering some interpretive question with the context and then you're going to you can summarize your contextual work and you're going to ask what do I still need to know maybe there's a key word and then we'll do some word study maybe there's clearly um, some historical background that you would need and so you'll do some historical background work which may mean using the, the Keener volume the IVP background commentary, or a Bible dictionary. Uh, perhaps if you know Greek and you have access to that, you can do some careful syntactical analysis to see if there's any insights from the way the, the, the Greek phrases things within your text. Um, we're gonna, I'll show you how to compare parallel passages in 
that are in Matthew that with those found in Mark and Luke to get some insights. And so again, it depends on the question that you're attempting to answer and how much time you have and what additional data you need to better make sense of the evidence that you've drawn from the context. The last thing you'll do in interpretation before doing your final summary is you will be looking at a couple of commentaries, at least two, to, to get a sense of are you on the right track? Uh, do you, does the commentary affirm what you found? Does it nuance what you found? Or does it actually challenge what you found? And then you're gonna kind of work through the options and come to the best conclusion based on which option has the most evidence. Do all the structural relationships and types of evidence all become second nature at some point? Yes, but having said that, that doesn't mean it will happen this semester. Uh, if you're in the MDiv or in Master of Arts in Biblical Studies, you'll be taking at least two IBS classes. That's because it really takes two full semesters to get a feel for IBS, and I, I mean that in, its, uh, in, in the real sense of the word, but even taking two classes doesn't mean you're going to have it all second nature. Like, for example, that structure sheet that you have available that, that has all the structures listed, a brief explanation, and then some sample questions. I kept the equivalent of that in my Bible for, I'm going to say, five or six years. That was even after I graduated, so I wouldn't forget something, right? So make sure you keep your notes in front of you so you don't assume you're going to be able to pull something out of your brain. You keep your notes available until you can go without them. But it will become second nature if you practice. How does one self-diagnose when under-interpreting or over-interpreting a passage. It's all based on evidence. And as far as under-interpreting, it would be pretty simple if uh, basically anybody could say exactly what you say, um, then you've under-interpreted. So you would, a good interpretation is going to bring out, um, the, the, not just state the obvious or not just be a paraphrase of the obvious or not simply download your favorite theology, but it's going to be a substantive engagement with the text. So it's going to be the amount of evidence. So again, under interpreting, if you're working on, once we get into the semester, these assignments take a while. So if you're working less than four to six hours on an interpretation survey, somewhat will not necessarily take that long. But if you're working on interpretation for less than four to six hours, you're probably under reading. Now, as far as over-reading, this is when you bring other things into the text. You're over-interpreting at any point that you can't demonstrate the veracity or truthfulness of your interpretation by citing evidence. So if you're assuming certain kind of theological positions, if you're saying something you heard a preacher say once, that's over-reading. So if it's not obvious on the basis of the evidence that you cite, you've overinterpreted a passage. How does a student approach working with ideas that may seem slightly divergent from some aspects of important theology, say the idea of eternal sonship of Jesus prior to incarnation? If there's no communal willingness to openly explore the divergent ideas, maybe because of fear of stepping into heresy. Is, is it the fallacy of consensus opinion if the student yields to the established statements, suppresses divergent thinking, and toes the line? Well, the whole point of being inductive is to let the evidence lead you to the interpretation. Careful Bible study is going to show there are diversity within the, the canon. And so what's important is not to smooth everything over. So you don't want to read Mark into Matthew. You want to let Matthew say what Matthew wants to say. You want to let Paul say what Paul wants to say. You want to let Isaiah say what Isaiah wants to say. Then once you've given those texts their say, what the work of biblical theology does, which we'll do not this semester, but if in the second class when we do evaluation and application work, we're going to be putting what any discrete passage in the Bible says in conversation with the canon to get a sense of a biblical theology of an idea. Now, uh, I think what you're really getting at is should you be afraid that you're going to come up with some heretical idea by reading the text? No, because the nature of induction is you're allowing evidence to back up your interpretation. So as long as you have evidence, that is okay. And again, the last step, one of the last things we'll do and when we actually do interpretation 
is you'll be reading your interpretation with or even against what other commentaries have said. So you're basically putting it within a communal setting. And again, I always tell students, um, I mean, people have been reading the Bible for thousands of years. So if you literally come up with some unique interpretation that no one's ever seen, um, you could be right, but you want to really make sure you have enough evidence. Okay, so it's not about towing the line because we're not. Obviously, there are doctrinal frameworks, and we can um, you can push back and ask some more about this. But the point is letting the evidence go where it may. Otherwise, you're being deductive. And remember, theological doctrine emerges from the text. It's not just simply imposed on the text. And so, you know, some consensus opinions need to be pushed against. Um, others, again, we just it's about mustering evidence. And it's also, if you're you know, in a conversation with somebody and you're getting into a disagreement, it's always kind of a bad idea to really fight vigorously with somebody over the Bible. You want to have a conversation, you want to share your data, and you need to do things in a, in a pastoral manner. If you're talking to a lay person, if you're talking to a colleague, he's doing a context of respect and you want to listen. Because sometimes what seems to be divergent ideas or perhaps you've just seen a facet on a diamond that the other person can't see. Are there other methods of inductive Bible study than the one we're learning? If, if there are, I'm curious to know what they are and how they are different. Well, the obvious answer is yes. Um, the inductive Bible study that we teach at Asbury has roots from the biblical seminary in Pennsylvania. It goes all the way back to the English Bible movement that in some ways um, came out of um, in, at the beginning of the 20th century in response to theological liberalism. It was a call to get back to reading the text and not reading opinions about the text or reading historical reconstructions of the text. So, for example, you may have heard of Kay Arthur. She does inductive Bible study. Um, most of the popular versions of inductive Bible study that you say, and again, I have respect for all these. So this isn't, um, I'm not going to try to be um, patronizing or condescending, but a lot of them are lay level, and they're not really doing the same things that we're doing. They're more just underlining themes and always trying, and they're, and they're they're going to be more superficial than what we're going to do. Again, not saying that, these lay level studies are superficial, um, but it, to, compared to the kind of work that we're going to do, which is going to be the precursor for real graduate level biblical studies, most popular inductive Bible study instruction doesn't go in depth. Now, if you go into InterVarsity when you were in college, IVP, InterVarsity does inductive Bible study, and it's very similar to here. There's professors at Dallas Seminary, Howard Hendricks teaches inductive Bible study. Daniel Fuller at Fuller Theological Seminary is now retired. He taught a form of inductive Bible study that you see in um, preachers that have come out of Fuller. So yeah, there's different ways of approaching it that go into the, in, the idea of inductive Bible study. But as you'll see, this is a graduate level seminary, and so we're going to be doing things in depth. That would be the, the, the main difference that I would say. When do we give titles to the work, and when are we supposed to let the story be part of the collective whole? Well, you give titles um, as you go through it. The first step that you do in a survey is to give titles to all the paragraphs so that you can think through the text on your own. Now, maybe you're asking when do you give titles. At, when, once you find the main units and subunits and you organize it, then you want to give titles to each of your main units and then titles to your subunits along with verse references. Okay, when do you let the story be part of the collective? Um, in interpretation, uh, you always want to read within different levels of context. And so we'll talk about immediate segment level and book level. But once you get into interpretation, we start backing away from the immediate context and start thinking about how does this fit into the whole. So that's going to be a critical dimension of interpretation. And a couple of final thoughts. First, enjoy the journey. Uh, I love IBS. Uh, it changed my life when I took it. It was everything that I wanted uh, when I went to seminary. In fact, I would take my 
class that I took with David Bauer on Matthew and essentially trade in the Master of Divinity for it, because that has probably been the most influential course that I've ever taken in my academic career. So enjoy the journey. Again, it's a little awkward because you're learning some new things. Again, watch my videos on knowing your why. Commit to being a lifelong learner. Don't let yourself get frustrated, but enjoy the journey because this, this can be a great resource that will serve you well. Here I am. Um, when it gets to be the September of 2019, just not that long from now, it will have been 28 years that I've been doing inductive Bible study. It's been, I can't believe, but it's been a, it's been a great partner through my whole life, adult life. Again, keep track of problem areas and ask questions. I'm monitoring our discussions, so when you run into a jam, try to make yourself write down what is confusing you. So keep track of your problem areas and ask questions so that I can help you. And then just a quick reminder, I have videos on most aspects of IBS open and available to you. A lot of them are linked right in our class up in the resources near the top of the module section. But there's other videos that are available as well that um, on my YouTube channel where my videos are hosted. So if you just go to the um, homepage of that, you can find the whole playlist on inductive Bible study there for you. Let me know how I can serve you. Again, it's a pleasure to be leading this class. Uh, I look forward to some excellent work. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the week. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'm Brian Russell, and I will see you next time.